sounded. I have no sound. Go back there and reset. There we go. There's the sun. Take two. Shining sea. Most of them had never seen an ocean when they gathered off that beach in Normandy. Their country called, they never questioned. Proud to do their patriotic chore. The price was high, but they were buying freedom. Paid in full by the boys of 44. Many kissed their moms for the last time, then stayed behind on that far foreign shore. In a world where we take so much for granted, let's not forget the boys of 44. Sacrifice would change the course of history when they stormed those mighty guns ashore, then fought on all the way to final victory. Our nation's pride, the boys of 44. Every time I see old glory wave. I think of young men going off to war Then say a prayer for the freedoms that I'm living And just give thanks to the boys of 44 Many kiss their moms for the last time Then stay behind on that far foreign shore In a world where we take so much for granted Let's not forget the boys of 44 Just give thanks to the boys of 44 Thank you so much for that. Any prayer requests? Yes, ma'am.
done all they can do with her brain cancer that's too deep. And um, they've only given her six months, maybe. Yeah. Okay. She's in my prayers every morning. Anybody else? Unspoken. unspoken. Yeah, we have a lot of unspoken in our family right now. Anybody else? All right, let's go before the Lord. Father God, we love you so, so very much. Father, we want to thank you for this day. Lord, just uh, uh, you heard the couple of prayer requests there, Father God, just to, Pam has cancer, brain cancer. I can empathize with her on that. Father God, you delivered me from, from my brain cancer. Father God, I know that you can do Pam the same way. They said she's got six months to live, but she doesn't have any kind of a date stamped on the bottom of her foot. And Father, I know that that's just another word. Start with C with you, Father, so I know that you can meet her. And once again, Father, we bring this request to you. Father God, we just ask that you would uh, continue to heal Pam. Father God, just uh, the unspoken, that covers so many prayers. All those that are people I know are in the room or maybe watching on Facebook or YouTube, Father, that they just uh, they don't uh, know what to pray sometimes. But that unspoken prayer, Father God, covers everything. Or maybe they're just uh, uh, too shy to, to speak up a prayer or they don't want people to hear it. Father God, I ask that you just hear the petitions of those Father, in our minds, our hearts and minds, those watching on Facebook and, and YouTube, Father, because where do we go? Where do we turn but you? You have all the answers. Lord, you have all the hope. All, all our hope is in you. Father, just uh, the world always lets us down, but you never do. Father, you always answer our prayers, and we thank you for that. Father, I can't help but think maybe there's someone in the church here today, or maybe they're watching on Facebook or YouTube. Father God just has an emptiness in their heart. They don't know what's missing. They just know something is missing. Father, I pray by the end of this service that they would cry out to your son, ask him to come into their life and feel the emptiness that they have. I ask this in Jesus' precious, precious name. Hey, amen. amen. All righty then. Today's, script, uh, today's scripture will be various going to be going to be in several different places you know this is the day that I want to honor our fallen heroes I want to honor them uh, I, I wrote down some a few things that I looked up and that, uh, did you know that Ar Arlington National Cemetery is 639 acres I've heard 642 but I looked it up this morning. According to Google, it's uh, 639 acres. About 400,000 servicemen and uh, vet, vet servicemen and their qualifying dependents are buried there right now. They have 95,000 graves left, you know, places left to bury people. But they've got over 222 million eligible military ready that, that that are going to be buried there. How's that going to happen? We're going to have to to have another uh, begin, you know, make a like an Arlington Cemetery second phase kind of a thing. We're going to have to because we have got to honor our servicemen and women who have paid, paid the ultimate price. Amen? We just have to. You know, the there's been so many wars, that, and, uh, and there's going to continue to be more and more wars. You know, when I think about the, uh, a war that would be a war that, uh, where the most lives were lost in, in American war, uh, uh, that America has been part of, how many Americans were lost, you know, you'd think it would be uh, World War II, something like that. But did you know that it was actually our Civil War? Exactly our Civil War. World War II, there's 416,000 right at it, pretty close, you know, give or take. But in our Civil War, 620,000 lost. That's just us fighting amongst each other, you know. It's for states' rights, don't get me wrong. Had a, had a, a reason for it. 
But it's part of us righting wrongs in our country too. You know, we've been... But so many Americans have paid the ultimate price. Amen? You know, I can't imagine how many... How many... Uh, actually have died for this country. Soldiers. But I tell you who does know is God. He knows each and every one. He knows them by name. He knew them in their mother's womb. Before that even. But He knows. And He cares about them. Jesus says in, uh, in John chapter 15 verse 13, Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. What does that mean, lay down your life? Well, for servicemen, it means that you lay down the life that you used to have and that you are living, whether whatever career you might have had or anything like that, family, and you sign up to be in the military to serve your friends. To lay down your life for your friends. Amen? And that's what so many have done. But you know, uh, right about this time of year and, and coming up uh, Independence Day too, uh, I was thinking about Old Glory. We proudly fly uh, Old Glory here at Raptor J Cowboy Church. And the red stripes on that flag represents the blood that has been shed, those lives that have been given, uh, you know, just uh, laid down for this great country. Amen? And I like, and I always say that that first stripe on the very top represents the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the first one who died and gave, shed His blood and died for our freedoms. Jesus died so that we would be set free. Amen? And that concept is what started this great, great country of freedom, founded on freedom. It's the land of the free and the home of the brave. But you know, I think a better truism is it, it's the land of the free because of the brave. Amen? But I know God knows each and every person. But, and, and listen, let me continue reading there because this is the, what I'm talking about that the, Jesus is the first blood shed there. Jesus goes on to say, you are my friends if you do not uh, if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I call you friends. For everything that I've learned from my father I have made known to you. And Jesus calls them friend because he says no greater love than someone laid down his life for his friends. And that's what Jesus Christ did. He laid down his life for all of us. All of us. Amen. So on this Memorial Day, remember that. We are free, first of all, because Jesus set everybody free. Amen. And then thank all of the men and women, the, the, uh, our soldiers who have paid the ultimate price, of course. Amen? You know, despite your, uh, despite your uh, political leanings or anything like that, I think we can all agree that uh, we're tired of war. Y'all tired of war? The title of today's message is War, War Weary. That's a little tongue tired tire for me. War Weary. Probably should have picked another name if I got to say it like that, amen. But anyway, the War Weary. Uh, today, let's look at the, through the lens of Scripture and bring the Scripture to bear on how uh, we should view war as Christians. And when we look at the words battle, war and peace in the Bible, there are five realities about war that bubble up to the surface. So let's look at those realities. Reality number one, God is at war. If we're going to consider war, that's the first place, that's the first place we should start is, is God, is God. And God is at work. 
It is at war. There's, a, there's an actual spiritual in, in the spirit, actual uh, spirit beings in the cosmic, er, in, in the spiritual realm who are at war right now and continue to be. It's a war that started in eternity's past. It's when, and it's between God and Satan. Isaiah speaks of this in Isaiah 14, chapter 12, verse, verses 12 through 15. He said, How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth. You, uh, you who once lay, laid low the nations. You said to in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the, the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on my on uh, uh, on the mount of, of assembly, on the uh, uh, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above all the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the, the Most High. But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. Revelation goes a little, a little bit more in depth about that in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. John saw the vision and he said, And there was a war in heaven, Michael and, the, and his archangels, uh, Michael and his angels, excuse me, fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not, uh, not strong enough and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon who hurled, who was hurled down, was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the to the earth, and his angels with him. It is a war that has been going on ever since that point. And it is a war against the goodness of God and Satan. And it continues to go on to this day. And will continue on until the end of time. And that war bleeds over into our realm. Our realm. And uh, it takes the place, you know, the devil, I can see him working. You know what the devil has always demanded and whether he's in the form of Molech or Baal or, or anything like that. He's always demanded a sacrifice of our children. Did you know that? Amen. Always. And there are so many Americans that will gladly uh, just, uh, just give their, just sacrifice their children. I don't think they realize it. But sacrifice their children to, to that, to the devil. Because that's what it is. It's just wrapped as the same package as before. He hasn't changed his ways. He still does the same thing over and over and over again because it works. And he wants us to sacrifice our children in our schools too through this wokeism garbage. Trying to, to mold their minds. Take them away from the truths of God's Word. Amen. I heard, uh, I forget what... Uh, there's a black preacher, I don't remember his name now, but he said, you know, that's, you're just, you're just uh, teaching our kids to go to hell. Just teaching our kids to go to hell. There is a war. That war bleeds over because the devil wants to get us. God loves us, so he hates us. And the war is, he wants us. He doesn't want us to go to heaven to be with God. He wants us to go to hell where he's going to go. And I think he knows where he's going. He's promised that. He's smart. I think he understands that. So the first reality, number one, is that God is at war. We need to realize that and keep that in mind. Reality number two, wars pervade History. You know, as someone once said that uh, his, the history of mankind is the history of wars. 
And if you pick up any history book in the classrooms, and, and I think it will back up that statement. You know, I think that's a pretty accurate statement. It is a, a history of war. What about the Bible? What about that one and only sacred book? What does it say? Man, it's full of wars. It's full of them. The first documented war in Scripture was in Genesis chapter 14 where there's an assortment of kings uh, went to war near the, the, the Dead Sea in the days of Abraham. And later, after they were God delivered the Israelites from Egypt and wandered around in the desert for 40 years and, and He finally took them to the promised land. They were a virtual war machine. They had to defeat 10 nations to start out with. And they were at war from that point on. It spilled over into the, uh, into the time of the judges and the kings of Israel and Judah. It was against nations like they warred against nations like the Philistines, Assyria, and Babylon. And we cannot forget all the Mites. The Amalekites, the Amorites, all the Mites. They were, they were at war with them too. You should read about it in the, in the Bible. I remember the Amalekites because Saul was killed by one. He was supposed to. God told him to, to uh, eradicate all of them, but he didn't. He ended up getting killed by one. Here or there, that's, uh, that's not that important, but uh, it's very interesting that uh, if we don't do what God says sometimes, do the pick. Anyway, I'll get off of that. <laughs> but the wars continued, like I said. You know, the prophets, they spoke of wars that would pervade, pervade human history. So whether you pick up a history book in the classroom or pick up a Bible at home or at the church, War permeates the pages. Amen. But why? That brings us to our next reality. Reality number three. Wars come from within. Classically, wars are fought on the battlefield. You know, this they, they use the uh, that's the way we, we look at it. Nations rising against nations and things of that nature. That's what we see as wars. But there is a simple definition of war, which is it is a condition of hostility and, a, and opposition by which injury, and in, uh, injury is inflicted against uh, the opposition to gain victory. Wars don't just happen between states and countries. It happens in marriages. It happens in the workplace. It happens at schools. It happens at home. It happens, good friends who used to be good friends end up enemies. I mean, what, what comes to your mind? I'll tell you what came to my mind when I was putting the Hatfields and the McCoys. Amen? Now that's one. They're at war. Why? Because it began within. It began within. James the half-brother of Jesus, says in his epistle in uh, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, he says that where do wars and, uh, wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from, the, uh, from your desires for pleasure, the war in your members? You lust, and you do not have. You murder and you covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. And he goes on to say, you don't receive when you do ask because you ask for the wrong motives so that you can spend what you receive on yourself. But it comes from within. Apostle Paul, remember back when I just when I said that in the opening that there is a uh, an invisible realm where these wars take place. The war uh, the, in the in the spirit realm. You know, each one of us has a foot in the spirit realm. Did you know that? Our spirit is in the spirit realm. One third of you 
is in the spirit realm. I think it's pretty cool. Apostle Paul speaks about that somewhat in uh, in in Romans chapter one, two, four, one, two, four. Romans chapter seven, verses twenty two and twenty three. He says, "For this, for in my inner being, I delight in God's law." That's the saved spirit. But I see another law at work in my in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my of my mind and making me a, a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. The war that goes on inside each and every one of us. It is that war when it what's the old old saying about the uh, the, the old Indian grandfather was talking to his grandson and, and uh, he said, the, uh, grandson, there's two wolves in each one of us. There's a good wolf and a bad wolf. And the grandson said, grandfather, which, uh, which one wins? And he said, it's the one you feed. You see, there's that nature that dwells in us like Paul, so Paul was talking about right there that uh, that law, that the one is, I love the ways of God. I love God's law because that's in my spirit where I'm saved. But in this flesh where there dwells no good, it's at war with me in my spirit. And sometimes it gets a foothold. Amen? And I believe that that's, see, I believe that every war begins in the inside of a man. That's where it begins. And then it spills out, it grows. It festers. And it becomes a war. Amen? Wars come from, the, from within. Reality number four. Wars will increase. And if you think you're tired of war right now, this uh, <laughs> it's not going to get any better. In fact, they're going to increase exponentially as time goes on. Uh, you know, with all of our learning and our technolo technological advances, you'd think that we would learn ways to stay out of wars. But instead, we just learn better ways to annihilate one another, and sometimes a, a good portion of the earth as well. There are periods of peace. I mean, we've experienced those, but the up the, the trend is upward for war. Jesus, when he was speaking uh, speaking about the the tribulation period, he he spoke of uh, he spoke of, of of wars as well. He predicted the great tribulation, and in chapter and Matthew chapter twenty four, verses six through eight, he says this about the, about the, the future wars. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but but see it see to it that that, that you are not alone. Such things must happen, but the end is still uh, uh, is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, earthquakes in various places, and earthquakes in various places. Wars are going to continue. In fact, he goes on to say in verse 8, as these are, in, are the beginning of birth pains. What does that mean? Birth pains, you ladies know exactly what that means. You start out with a few pains and they get intense. They get more intense and more intense. Quicker, I mean, more, uh, more often. Next thing you know, here comes a baby. Well, that's what's happening with us. These wars are going to happen closer and closer together, more intense and more intense until they climax at the end, the final war. Amen? That's what's going to happen. But they're going to increase. Apostle Paul says in the, uh, says that in, in the First Thessalonians chapter five verse three he says that uh, uh, they say peace and safety, but that's falsehood. It's, it's a false peace and safety. Sudden destruction will come 
in the form of the last great war of Christ, which brings me to the next real, uh, real uh, reality. And that is reality number five, and the final one, last one. Wars will cease. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. They will cease. There is a, a time that we will experience when there is no more war. But history is moving somewhere. It's moving, and, it's, and God has predestined this. He's, he's predestined it. He is in complete char in charge of us at this last war. Amen. Mankind's going to continue to slug it out in wars. But at the mean, in the meantime, at the same time, the gospel is going to be promoted uh, to, in the, uh, to the four ends of the, of the earth. The gospel of peace. When the trumpet of God is sounded, Christ will gather His church that's already in heaven. That's all of us. He will come down on a white horse. And guess what, guys? We're in His posse. We're riding horses too. Ain't that cool? It's, the, it's that last and final war. See, old Satan, he has... He goes through all of this at this time. It, it's him doing this. And he takes us up to this, this one final point. In the tribulation, he has amassed such a great army the world has never seen. All the nations of the earth have soldiers at this, at this, at, at, at this battleground, this final battleground. It's where the, the blood will be as deep as the, as the horse's bridle. Jesus comes out of and, and, and Revelation 19 says that uh, Jesus will appear on his white steed, on his white horse. We'll be with him on our horses. But let me paraphrase what's going to happen, if you will. He's going to come out of the clouds. We're going to be right there with him. If you think we're going to come down and fight, nope, nope, nope. Not going to come down here and fight. See, I think Jesus is going to say, hey guys, stay back here. I got this. Oh, devil, he is. He thinks he's, he's got an army that'll do it finally. He didn't have quite as good an army in heaven. But he thinks, boy, he's got one now. You know, in some ways, the devil's done. But anyway, here comes Jesus, and the Bible says in, in, in uh, Revelation 19 that, a, that a, uh, uh, the sword, a devil edged sword comes out of his mouth. The devil is prepared all through from eternity's past up to this moment for this, this very moment where he thinks he can uh, defeat God and rise above him. And what does Jesus come down there and do? He spoke a word and destroyed that army. Amen. Completely obliterated that army. And then the really cool thing is, is that, that uh, John said that there was a, an angel that appears in the sun, but probably not in the sun, but, you know, towards the sun. And he called all of the birds of the earth to come have uh, what he calls the, the supper that God has prepared. Yeah. And that supper is all of, the, all of the dead soldiers in the devil's army to feast on. Amen. That's the last battle. That's the last war. And then there's a time of peace that's ushered in. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4, describes it somewhat. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes from many peoples. They will beat their, their swords into, plow, into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will, no, will not take up sword against nation nor will they train for war any longer. All the former things like death and, and war, they're passed away. We're finally in a time of peace. And until that day, what can we do? Just taking what we've learned here today, what can we do? Well, I've got some applications for I have two applications for, for this. 
Verse number one. Prefer peace. Prefer peace. Psalm 120, verse 7, it says this. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. See, this psalmist, he wanted peace, but his enemies wanted war. You know, I believe that we need to defend ourselves, but we should want peace. We should value peace more than, than war. We should pray for wisdom in our leaders. Well, i tell you what, guys. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. I'll stay away from that right now. So it would be so easy for us to end up in a war right now. So easy. It's a dangerous time. You want to hear what I think about it? Just talk to me after services. <laughs> but uh, we should desire and prefer peace. We need to value the souls of our enemies. The Bible says to pray for your enemies. Do good to your enemies. I'm not saying on the battlefield now. That's the time, a time of war is the time to kill folk. That's what a war is. But God loves our enemy. He loves all mankind. We should keep that in mind. Value the souls of our enemies. And we need to pray for peace in Jerusalem because that's where all of us kind of centered around. It's all centered around Jerusalem. They've been at uh, war. They're always at war. They're always at war. The devil's always got somebody he wants to put up against them. Always. Because it's God's chosen people. So naturally, he hates them. But everything's going to revolve around that. This is going to be around Jerusalem when that final battleground is going to be. Amen? And number two, we need to wage peace. You know, we know what it's like to wage war. But why not wage peace? Why not? I'll give you a couple of ways to to wage peace. A, you need to share the gospel of peace. Ephesians chapter, chapter 6, verse 15. This is where Apostle Paul is talking about putting on the full armor of God. He says in verse 15, and with your feet fitted with the readiness of, that, that comes with the gospel of peace. So we need to share the gospel of peace. Apostle Paul tells us to, to cover our feet with the, with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And the best way to stop war in the world is not through military might, but it's through the changed heart. You know, in our country, this great country, we have pretty much legislated all prejudices and things of that nature out of our laws through the civil rights movements. But there are still prejudices that still exist, but they exist in the hearts of men. Because you can't legislate that. You can't pass a law that will make somebody not be prejudiced in their heart. But Jesus is the great changer of men's hearts. So what is this spreading the gospel? Share the gospel of peace. What is the gospel message? It's the good news. It's the good news that Christ died for our sins. That we have forgiveness for our sins. And it's also good news that He's going to come dwell inside you and change you from the inside out. And begin a process of remaking you into His image. So share the gospel of peace. 
And to wage peace, we also need B, to make peace in your own world. In Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said in Matthew ch uh, chapter 5, verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Paul said also in Romans uh, chapter 12, verse 18, If it is possible, as, as, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Let your every action Say so, well. What I mean is, if we let our every action be an action of peace, then you're going to change your world around you. And God, then we will change. Enough of us do that. We'll change the world. Amen. So wrapping this up, we need to ask a few questions. We need to ask ourselves a few questions. We're putting our hope. What are we putting our hope? Are we putting our hope in political parties or guns or, or bombs? Or are we putting it in the gospel of the kingdom of God? Do we have a passion for uh, uh, for the love for love and justice of the world? Are you saddened? Or are we saddened by the violence and destruction of war? Are we thankful for the sacrifice of those who made, uh, who fought for our freedoms? There are some who are not in this country. God forbid. Are we committed to being peacemakers in our world? And what I mean by that is, like I said, in the world around us. Are we trying not to fight with one another? Are we bringing a, a spirit of calm into a, an argument? Amen? May we may Jesus in the New Testament determine our worldview and not the culture of the day. Man, you know, Jesus spoke, spoke about uh, well, let me say this, Jesus died so that we could be free. And in order to experience that freedom, you need to ask Christ to forgive you of your sins. And ask Him to come into your life. And then you will be set free, the Bible says. You'll be set free indeed. Apostle Paul said also in Romans that in, in Romans chapter 3 verse 10 he says that there is no one righteous not one. There is no one who seeks God. If we're going to change the world we need to first change within. And how we do that is like I said we ask Christ to come into our hearts. He is the great changer of men's hearts. But it says that we will there's no one who seeks after God, and that's the truth. You remember when you were a sinner? You remember when could, uh, when somebody would talk about God to you and you just, nah, I don't want to hear it. You know what I'm talking about? Because the truth is, is that we will never come to God. We're perfectly happy in our sin, but He comes after us. Jesus said, no one comes to, to me except for the Father draws them. God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to the knowledge of His Son. Ask Christ to come into their hearts. God began to work on me when I was just a little boy. Here and there, little things. And it finally just grew to 
to a to a point where I couldn't turn away from him. Everywhere I turned, God, somebody was talking to me about Jesus. Every every direction that I turned, I couldn't escape it. See, because that's God getting after you. That's God calling you to His Son. I hope that everybody in this room has experienced that. But if you haven't, maybe somebody's been, uh, maybe somebody has been talking to you about Jesus. Maybe you're at that point where I was in 1983, where I went forward to the church in Rockwall and asked Christ to come into my heart. I'd been hearing about God. I'd been hearing about Jesus. But I went to that church because I promised my wife I would. I wasn't saved when we, uh, when we got married, but I promised her I'd go to church. Went into that church, led my family into that church. And when I heard that old scarred up preacher, Ted Hicks was his name, when he said, come at the end of that service, I got up out of my seat, didn't want to. I said to myself, I wasn't going to do it. I'm not going to embarrass myself in front of a bunch of people. But when he said, come, it was as if God himself told me, get up out of that pew and get up in front of that church. And I hooked him up there. I got there as quick as I could. Got down on my knees. And I cried out to God. And I asked Christ to come into my heart. Were you at that point in your life? Maybe you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. God is drawing you to His Son. And I'm going to ask, I'm going to pray. I started doing this. I'm going to do it again. I'll continue to do this. Since God is the one that draws us to His Son, uh, I don't. I never want to try to talk somebody into going to heaven. I don't want to scare the hell out of anybody. Salvation is between God and you. Amen. It's God's work. It's not ours. Since I don't know who God is getting ready, then I need to pray this prayer, if you will, with every head bowed. And if, they, and if you feel the draw, then say the prayer of salvation right after it with me, if you will. Father God, I love you so much. Father, I'm asking at this moment that you would touch that person you've been working on. Father God, if today is the day of salvation for them, Father, I'm asking that you would draw them to your Son at this very moment. If you felt that draw when I said that, then pray this prayer. I mean it from your heart. Just admit to the Lord, I know I'm a sinner. And right now, Lord, I turn from that sin. I agree, Lord, that you are right and I am wrong. And I want to do things your way. So, Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my heart now. I receive you by faith into my spirit. I believe you died on that cross for my sin. You rose back to life. You're living in me now. From this moment forward, I will serve only you. In Jesus' name, amen. Say that prayer for the first time. I need to talk to you about it. It's the most important decision you'll make this out of eternity. And uh, so I need to talk to you about it. If you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, the telephone number's right there. Blue book on Facebook, that blue bar. It'll get me and right the J Cowboy Church website will get me too. Uh, like I said, that's the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. And I need to talk to you about it. It's very important that I talk to you about it. Let's pray one last time. We'll get on out of here. Father God, we love you so, so very much. Father God, I thank you for this day. Father, Lord Jesus, first of all, we recognize you. You were the first sacrifice to bring us freedom. And that led to countless others sacrificing their lives to keep that freedom. Father God, we just want to remember you first. And Lord, then we want to remember all of those who have given their lives for this great nation. And those in your army as well, Lord Jesus, that have given their lives. Father, until we can get back up here next Sunday, I ask for your perfect speed in our lives. Father, I ask that you, uh, for your favor in our lives, show us how to take these things that we're learning, apply them to our lives, so that we can be doers of your word, not hearers only. Especially with these days, uh, the, the time drawing nearer and nearer to your coming. Father, love you. It's a pleasure to serve you. 
We ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, guys, love you so much. I'm going to say this before we do Sunday side out. Uh, I meant to say it before I started preaching. Uh, it's better. 